So some of you that may know me know that I, I hate speaking. Some of you do know me then, because I love speaking. <laughs> but what I like to start with is I, I don't like giving talks, but I like starting conversation. And that's something I say at the beginning of each one of these things, because I truly mean it. And I feel as though if at the end of this session, my voice is the only voice you hear, similar to the reason why they ran this conference, I know what I think and what I feel and what I do, but I think it's more important to be able to get all of the voices that are in the room to see how we can actually advance things in a positive direction, to see what other people think, to learn how other people experience things. And so I don't want you to be shy today. I really want this to be a conversation. I want this to be challenging. I want this to be uncomfortable at times, because if we don't actually have true conversation about the things that are happening, we're not going to be able to make any changes. And I think that that's sometimes a, a difficult position for people to be in because they want to feel comfortable and that's natural. Right? Like that is something that we all want to go to a comfortable place. Yet, in order to address the things that are happening at times, we need to get outside of our comfort zones and be able to first acknowledge them without necessarily assigning blame, without doing it in a pejorative way, but just acknowledging what is happening and then being able to move forward from that. So the title to my talk, they are wonderful because they asked me for this title like a year and a half ago because they've been planning this so well, but was, intersectionality, code switching versus Uncle Tom. Now, what did you think you were going to hear when you saw a title, intersectionality, code switching versus Uncle Tom? What does that even make you think about anyone? Dr. Finks. See, I get the opportunity to now to, to call upon my... Yeah. <laughs> No, I know, but so, so that, wonderful. No, because here's the thing. Everything that someone says is a teaching point, right? No idea. I mean, he may just be joking, but some people may have no idea, right? So what is an Uncle Tom? Who is Uncle Tom? Where does that phrase even come from? Anybody know about Uncle Tom? Who knows Uncle Tom? Harry Beecher Stowe? Who's Harry Beecher Stowe? So, ah. So, so, Dr. Joe, I think that you are three steps ahead of many people right now because you just talked about the situation without necessarily explaining what Uncle Tom actually is. So some people may still not know what Uncle Tom, and now here's the thing, who's uncomfortable? If I were to say, raise your hand if you don't know who Uncle Tom is, you'd probably be uncomfortable acknowledging that you don't know because you think everybody else in here knows this thing, I can't tell them. So th that, that is real, right? So someone raised their hand in the back just now. What just happened? So you said that Uncle Tom is what you call a black person who's a sellout, right? So where it comes from, and the interesting thing about what, what Dr. Dr. Joe just said is that in Harry Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the way that Uncle Tom was originally depicted was not the way that we now actually think of when we use that epithet. It was actually from sort of renditions of that story that came out afterwards that described this man who was a slave in a way that made him sound like he was this minstrel show black man who panders to the white man and, and does everything that they ask him to do for fear of then being beaten or not being let into the house or being seen as difficult or one of those black people that you keep outside, right? So in today's day and age, an Uncle Tom is someone that, as you said, and it, it's, it is specifically when it's referenced mostly, you know, a black person thing. But it has been used to really describe someone who is in a position that is lower than someone else or something else, but does not stand up for the things that would actually advance the population that they're in, right? So a sellout. Now, does anybody know code switching? If I said code switching, what does that mean? You're nodding, young man. Young, yes, ma'am. Like when you're with African Americans, you'd use French, and when we're with other people, you'd use Spanish, right? But what?
Anybody? Still, still English. Okay. Some, sometimes. Sometimes. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. She said it's someone like adapting your language to the environment, to the norms that you think are appropriate. Would you like to give me an example? So, I, you know, you jump right into, I was going to wait for a bit, but the way you just described that, like, took away all my points. So, I'm going to do what I do, and I don't know what to say, and I'm going to let somebody else say it. Oh, you're right. He said, he said, he said, he said one eighth black. So I show that is code switching a good or a bad thing? It's a good thing. Talk to me. Tell me, talk to me about that. It's a strategic thing, it's a good thing. Tell me more. And Jasmine will be finishing the talk for me. Thank you very much. So, no, thank you. Thank you very much. That's awesome. I saw a hand on this end a second ago.
So can you think of any time where code switching would be seen as bad? Because this would. So I, I will use that to tell a little bit about myself for those that may not know me. So I'm originally from Nigeria, born in West Africa. I'm of the Yoruba tribe. These little details I'll tell you will be important because of the various intersections that I feel I have. So from Nigeria, but I'm West, I'm, I'm Yoruba. Then we moved to the States when my family was young. Both of my parents had to redo their residency training at Howard University in pediatrics. My mom then did her pediatric intensive care fellowship at Johns Hopkins. My dad did his neonatal intensive care at Georgetown. We then moved to Indiana, where I went to a private school from, third, from fourth grade to eighth grade. I then went back east to Deerfield Academy, a boarding school for high school that is very diverse and has people from all over the world that come to that high school, but it's very elite institution with a lot of privilege that exists there as well. And that was the first time where I realized that I was actually being treated differently because of the color of my skin, which was not something that I'd really ever felt before, because I'd always been around all sorts of people of all sorts of different types and from different places, speaking different languages, and I never felt that specific thing. While in high school, I played basketball, soccer, lacrosse, track. I was a president of my class. I was captain of the teams. I was a leader of the Christian student fellowship groups. I won these two awards at junior year and senior year that was essentially the, we didn't have a valedictorian, but it was sort of the best representative of the institution as a junior and then as a senior. I was an actor. I sang in the acapella group. And so I, I did lots of things in high school that I enjoyed as well, not because I was X. I did not play basketball because I was black. I played basketball because I liked basketball, right? I didn't sing a cappella because I was trying to be white. I sang a cappella because I enjoyed a cappella, right? So all the different things I did, the color of my skin or any other demographic factor that I was, was not the reason alone for that. But now here's the other thing. All these things do contribute as well, okay? So maybe, it was some of the people that enjoyed the certain things that looked a certain way that then got me interested in doing that. But that doesn't mean that's the only reason you do it. I then went to, I went to Stanford for undergrad where I continued doing some of the things I did. I ran track all four years, was all American, was captain of the team my last two years, and then almost went to the Olympics. Instead of going straight, I went straight to medical school. While I was there, I actually majored in honors interdisciplinary studies in the humanities for pre-meds. And I wrote an honors thesis titled Illness Narratives the bridge between the kingdom of the ill and the kingdom of the well, where I felt as though a lot of people are wonderful scientists but terrible physicians because they forget about the patient, okay? And so it was about listening to the patient voice and seeing that the patient has a lot to contribute to the conversation as well. And this should be the primary person contributing to this conversation. I then came to this lovely institution for medical school and spent all four years here before matching into orthopedic surgery residency at Yale. It was in my third year of orthopedic surgery residency that I had a diving accident I had a spinal cord injury and was paralyzed from my chest down with very minimal use of my upper extremities. I had two surgeries there before coming back to the Midwest to do inpatient rehab at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, now called the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. And I was blessed with some return of motor function and that drastically changed the trajectory of my recovery. I then went back home to Indiana where I did outpatient therapy and got a master's degree in engineering, science and technology entrepreneurship from Notre Dame. And at that time I worked with Cleveland Clinic in something called Custom Orthopedic Solutions to work on creating medical devices to then have solutions for people's problems. And at that time, I worked on a device to make pedicle screw placement and spine surgery faster, safer, more, festive, more effective, and costly. I then worked in the community, and actually someone who just made his announcement that he's running for 2020, his name is Mayor Pete Buttigieg. He's the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, appointed me to the St. Joseph County Board of Health, and I worked with various nonprofits and technology companies while I was still in South Bend. I was asked to then do a family medicine residency in that town and then completed my family medicine residency before coming back here to be family medicine, rehab medicine, and in the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. So I say that not to pat myself on the back, but because you hear a lot of the different things that have come into my life. While I grew up, I was too black for the white people, but I was too white for the black people. Even in my country, the way I spoke my language, Yoruba, I was teased that I sounded like an Igbo person which is one of the other tribes, even though we moved to this country when I was two years old. And the reason that I could speak the language was because my grandparents and my parents spoke some at home, but my friends and I continued trying to speak on our own. 
So I didn't have any formal training in that language. And so I was trying my best to fit into the culture that I thought I was supposed to be in. And even that was difficult, right? Then in school, I was too much of an athlete for the scholars. I was too much of a scholar for the athletes. In the disabled population, now I'm able to walk some. And so I've lost my crip card to some people, which I'm, I'm serious. And this is something that's in jest at times. But the fact that I can get out of my chair is seen to some as I don't fit the club anymore because I have function that people don't have. But then in the able world, this world is not accessible to us in the same way. And so I'm too disabled for the able-bodied folks, too able for the disabled folks. So all of my life, I felt like I've had one foot in one world and one wheel in the other, not being able to fit in. And so I've lived a life of code switching because you have to do it for survival. You have to do it to make it comfortable. And now here's the thing about why I bring it up in this particular setting. We talked about speaking different languages. In what you heard about my story, both of my parents are physicians. Would you agree that the language of medicine is different? And I don't just mean the words, but the language and the culture of medicine is something that if you have not been exposed to that in some way, you don't know how to speak that language. And now how many of you learned multiple languages when you were kids? How many people tried to learn another language when they were an adult? Which one was easier? It's easier to learn a language as a kid, isn't it? And so I was raised in a household where I saw medicine by both of my parents, by aunts and uncles and family members. And so I know and I acknowledge a certain level of privilege that I have, despite the fact that even along the way, people still try to find reasons to discount me. People still find that I find reasons to keep me out. But I understood this language in a way that I knew the currency of medicine in a way that I almost couldn't even articulate for a long time. And so when you have people now, you have a first generation student, you have someone who has never been exposed to this, hasn't had someone to be able to teach them the language of this culture, and then they get there and they speak the only language they know how to speak, and that is not one that is conducive to success within this, this health system, we are not doing a good job of teaching them that language. We do teach them the basic science. We do teach them the clinical work, but then we expect that that's going to be enough to be able to be successful in medicine. And it's not. And it's without, without things like Doctors of Tomorrow to then reach down and start teaching students, not just the clinical parts of medicine, but how to speak the language as well, we're not going to be able to adequately set people up for success. And we need to realize that sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes there'll be people that don't want you speaking another language. There'll be times where it might not be safe. How many of you that your parents speak another language, do you love it when they say it in the language that nobody else can understand? Because if they said out loud in English what they just said to you, you would be afraid that they would have taken mom away right now because of the words that she just used, right? And so it's sometimes it's protective as well to be able to have a, and this is sometimes a taboo word now, but a safe space, right? Some people just want to be able to be comfortable. And I said at the beginning that the things that make us comfortable are often the things that we know, right? And so a lot of the questions that people ask is that, you know, why do all the black people sit together, right? But a lot of times it's because that's where they know things, that's where they're comfortable. And it's not that we are saying that the other groups of people are excluding them intentionally, but without intentionally including as well, that is the same. And without acknowledging that the reason that they may feel uncomfortable, and I just use black and white right now just as something that is a palatable, understandable concept. I could have used disability at the same point. I could have used being a woman. I could have used uh, being a Muslim. I could have used any one of the various demographic groups that are often marginalized to say, sometimes the things that you know bind you together. But what I like people to see is that with intersectionality, there may be things that you don't know about someone that would bind you together that you wouldn't have found out if you didn't talk to them. If they weren't included, if these people weren't there, there'll be no way for you to then learn some of the things that you don't know because you never spoke that language yourself. So you can't understand somebody else's language unless they teach it to you. You can try to go read it, but when you go live somewhere, 
when you immerse yourself in a culture, that's when you really learn that language the best. I remember writing my college application essay about the point at which I knew I was fluent in Spanish. And it's when I was dreaming in Spanish. I didn't acknowledge that until I came back to the States and I thought in Spanish and then had to translate to English. You don't ever really think about the language in which you think until you can realize that you're thinking in another one. And so I wrote this because that was when I realized the point of fluency. That's when I saw that this was something that I could do without thinking. And in fact, I had to actively think about doing it differently. So we have people that know one thing. And then we ask them to come into a system that is very different and expect them to act in a different way for some reason without giving them the tools to know how to act in the way you want them to. And then at the same time, I'm saying this is on both sides because the Uncle Tom part, when you are then seen as the person that is successful in the system because you've learned the language and know how to speak it, it's often the same people that look like you, sound like you're in the same group, but then call you a sellout because they think you're not doing what you should do to be able to advance everyone else. Now, there are times where that might be the case. There are absolutely times where that might be the case where a lot of us could do a much better job of pulling up the people below us. A lot of us could do a much better job of just pulling up the people around us, but we don't do that. And I'm gonna be very uncomfortable, oh, go for it, please. Thank you. And, and at any point, I want people to interject because when I get on a roll, I just keep rolling. So <laughs> you're, you're going to have to do that at some point. And, and I'm going to be wrapping up soon here anyway. But the, the thing about this, right, is no single one of us is free from blame. We all have the way that we feel or think that comes from all the things that we were made by, right? And so that's something that I want to encourage us all during this weekend conference to be able to help each other by not pointing fingers. There's a phrase that I used at a talk I gave a little bit ago where I was talking about, so I, the, the quick story was, I gave a talk at Dartmouth and they put me up in the Dartmouth Hotel for. The Dartmouth Hotel is this historic hotel, really, really old. And I was looking inside and I was looking around, there are pictures all on the walls. And it wasn't lost upon me that not a single person in that picture looked like me. And so the next day I went there and I said, well, thank you so very much for the lovely accommodations. And I said, no, I, I looked at the pictures on the wall, and interestingly here, you have me for your MLK Day symposium, and there were no black people anywhere, right? And, and this is the thing, though. I say, I don't want to take away from all of the people that worked hard to get into Dartmouth, because they have to work hard to get into Dartmouth. But what you need to acknowledge is that the reason that there aren't a lot of black people on those pictures is because we weren't allowed in the institutions. So it's not like we just weren't working hard enough to get in. We were working really hard to make the cotton on the sweater with the nice D on it. I mean that, and that's uncomfortable for people, but this is the phrase I used. I said, the past is not your fault, but the future will be. So I'm not blaming for what happened before, but if you fail to acknowledge what that has then created, 
if you fail to acknowledge the fact that there are things that still exist today because of things that happened within the lifetime of people that are still alive right now, then you're not going to be able to then make a difference. And it's not about blaming people. It's about working together. But in medicine, right, we all come together to come to a diagnosis and then come up with a treatment plan. If you are not in the same page as to what the diagnosis is, the renal guy is going to be doing something different from the GI guy, different from the cardiologist. You're all going to be trying to reach a different goal because you don't agree as to what it is you're treating in the first place. And that's why I like to start with these conversations because a lot of times we're not having the same conversation. We're not speaking the same language. And we need to teach each other the languages that we speak in. And the book came out recently, this is the love languages, right? And I, I almost make that analogy too. People will speak in different languages and you need to work together to figure out how that person communicates, how you communicate. There will be a give and take. There will be some uncomfortable times, but if you're going to work together to move forward, we need to get through those. I'm going to call something else out that I told you guys I'm real. There have been criticisms before about these three young people sitting in front of me because they're working a conference that's supposed to be about increasing diversity in medicine, and people will criticize the people that are doing the work to say, there are no black people on that leadership team. And I say, look, I don't care what you look like if you're doing that work. And that's something that we need to be pulling everyone together because they're trying to improve something that they all have their stories for why this is something they're passionate about. You may not know anything about their background. You may not know who their parents are. They could be adopted by two black parents and this has been their entire life. They may have never seen a black person in their life, but they saw a movie one day and decided that's wrong, I'm gonna help. I don't care the reason why you want to help. But if you're helping, someone else shouldn't be getting in the way and hindering. So I want to challenge us all to do a better job of that, to acknowledge the language barriers that may exist, and to do our best job of acknowledging the various intersections that people have. And instead of trying to judge people by what they are not or what they don't have, pull people up and allow them to flourish by letting them capitalize on the things that they do have. 